Welcome everyone uh, to our June Necessary Conversation with Paul Srivastava. I'm Erica Steckler, co-director of the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at University of Massachusetts Lowell. I welcome you on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association today. Thrilled to see so many of you, so many familiar faces and new as well. I know many of you are tuning in from all around the time zone. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good middle of your night, and thank you for joining us. Um, today we'll be talking with Dr. Paul Srivastava on transforming management to address challenges of the anth Anthropocene. Um, and today's necessary conversation is sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility in the Manning School of Business at UMass Lowell. It's also hosted by the Center for Humanistic Management at the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. Um, I will be posting some Zoom logistics in the chat, so you'll see some, some things there, but we'll keep you muted on the bottom left. Um, please add any comments, questions, remarks, discussion points, resources in the chat as we get going, and we'll moderate the conversation with Paul um, through the chat. So again, please do put your questions there so we can have a, a robust conversation with him and all as we get toward the end of his remarks. By way of introduction, I think first I'll just say briefly, the Humanistic Management Association um, has been focused uh, on the protection of dignity and the promotion of well being. And this topic of transforming management in the Anthropocene falls very much into um, that spirit of what we as a, as a community are hoping we can accomplish. Um, we need and want um, and are working toward um, transformation. And I'm so delighted that Paul is here with us today to talk about that. Briefly, and there's so much I could say, uh, but Dr. Paul Srivastava joins us. He has a unique background that combines significant entrepreneurial and senior management experience, along with academic scholarship and teaching. He is currently the chair the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Pennsylvania State University, Director of the Sustainability Institute, and Professor of Management and Organizations at the Smeal College of Business. He's a full member of the Club of Rome and leads the UNESCO Chair in Art and Science for implementing the SDGs at the ICN Business School in Nancy, France. He has served as advisor, director, or founder and founder to numerous research institutions globally, and he also has a background in founding startups as well. Uh, Dr. Paul Srivastava, I'd love to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Erica. And uh, thank you to Michael and to David and to the entire group at the Humanistic Management Association for hosting this very important conversation. I am actually looking to learn from so many people on this call that I've known for almost 40 years now. In fact, I want to acknowledge John Grant on the on my screen on the left, who, under whose tutelage I did my PhD dissertation too many moons ago. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you what uh, I am doing. And it's not just me. I want to acknowledge what I have to say today is a real contribution from uh, the groups that I work with. Erica mentioned the Club of Rome. Uh, where I've been very active and the club itself has been very active on sustainability for well over 50 years. Many of you know its work through the limits to growth and we continue to uh, do more studies in that vein. Uh, and in addition, I want to acknowledge the work at Future Earths, an organization that I was working with prior to coming to Penn State. Uh, more and more in my later years, in my later career, I have been moving uh, away from traditional business studies. So while I recognize and know many of the names over here and respect their work, my own reading and my own work has moved away from business scholarship to uh, more science scholarship. So I spend more time on science and nature and the Lancet and magazines like that rather than AMR and AMJ. So I might seem a little bit disconnected and I want to uh, sort of just put that out as a caveat. Uh, the other caveat I must say is that as a 70 year old uh, coming out of 15 months of uh, COVID shutdown, 
and having more than three dozen friends and colleagues who have been directly impacted by COVID, my personal mood right now is one of uh, urgency, one of restlessness for action. And uh, so if I take shortcuts in giving you research details, I hope you'll be patient with it and understand why I'm jumping to action so quickly. Um, with that, let me see if I can share my screen and get a few prepared remarks out on the table so at least you get to know what my perspective it is, and then we can open it up for a conversation. I hope to be able to do this in about 20 minutes. Uh, so I have to hit a share screen. Okay. Yeah, so the title of the talk, if, if you can consider this a talk, I consider this a necessary conversation and I hope we'll keep it in that uh, informal mode of a conversation. But just a working title of what I want to address is what does it mean to manage for planetary well-being in the Anthropocene? I'll spend a little bit of time describing what I mean by the Anthropocene. Uh, and by using three or four key scientific studies, many of which were done by members of the Future Earth Network that uh, I was leading as the executive director, and now have become sort of the common knowledge for moving forward from where we are into the great transition towards sustainability. Uh, I believe transition to sustainability is urgent, and we can say, we can describe that urgency in many ways, but I want to concretize it by giving an example of what we human beings are doing to the carbon cycle and what role uh, 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 businesses can be playing in addressing uh, the carbon cycle as well as the carbon budgets. And then I have a few remarks about what it means to become a planetary civilization and create a planetary economy. And within that context, what is the role of corporations? So we look at that and then I'll describe ecological, social well-being as a way to reorient management, thinking, learning, and action. So let me begin with this slide, which is a summary of uh, uh, a number of years of work done by dozens of scientists called the Great Acceleration. And many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see what are called socioeconomic trends. On the right-hand side, you see earth system trends. And they are uh, tracked from 1750 to about 2010. All of these uh, horizontal axes are 1750 to 2010. 1750 is approximately the time industrial revolution began and we discovered energy and we started using energy. And uh, 2010 is about the time when we are sort of looking at this challenge of the Anthropocene. So on the left-hand side, you see world population, global uh, real GDP, foreign direct investment, many of the socioeconomic trends that we normally track. And on the right-hand side are earth system trends, something that we have been tracking even longer for the last several hundred year, years. There have been scientists who've been studying carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane in the atmosphere, ozone, surface temperatures, ocean acidification, et cetera. And there's only one trend that is worth noting in all of these charts. And I'm giving you only a sample of the charts. The studies actually cover many, many more variables. And that is that at around mid 1950s, somewhere uh, in this red uh, area, there's a kind of point of inflection where instead of going with a slow, steady rise, there is a kind of exponential rise in all these variables, both socioeconomic variables as well as earth system trends. So around 1950s, suddenly there's a kind of explosion that happens of humans on earth. And uh, there are many sociological reasons for it. There are many uh, political reasons for it, but suffice it to say that all of this explosion of human activity, whether it's economic, social, uh, building uh, uh, urbanization has had dramatic and exponential impacts on earth systems to a point 
that now the continued functioning of Earth system as a whole, as it has supported human civilizations in, for the past centuries, is now at risk. A second study that sort of reinforces some of the, these conclusions around the kind of risk that we are facing is the planetary boundary study. I've noted that in the last decade, there have been a number of papers in management scholarships that have addressed planetary boundaries. A summary of this idea is that there are nine boundaries of life that if we cross, uh, we are not likely to have human survival uh, at the, in the kind of quality that we had in the past. Of those nine boundaries, two of them are already in red zone, which is they're beyond uh, uncertainty. We know for sure that we are putting these systems at risk. That is biosphere integrity, genetic diversity, and biogeochemical flows of phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, and other uh, uh, key elements. For two of the boundaries, climate change and land system change, we are in the, what's called the yellow zone, which is a zone of uncertainty. We haven't crossed into a, a, a zone of certain destruction, but we need to be addressing those. And for the remaining five uh, boundaries, we either don't have good quantification, which is true for novel entities and atmospheric aerosol loading, or we are fair in the safe zone. So I think we are, overall, what these studies tell us is this is a point in human evolution where if we don't change the way, the way we have been working in the past 200 years, we are going to be crossing planetary boundaries and getting into deep trouble in terms of existence of this planet, uh, the way it has supported human existence in the past. I'll add to those two studies a smattering of other things with regard to social, economic, and what I'm calling anxiety accelerations. Uh, so population of the world, all of you know, at 7.7 .7 or 7.8 billion now is going to be 10 billion by the uh, middle of this century before it starts declining marginally. Uh, social acceleration caused by telecom and mobility and uh, global travel and digitalization of the economy and social interactions, uh, social media, all of this is causing life to happen faster and faster on earth. And this economic acceleration uh, has led us to an economy that is approximately 80 to $85 trillion globally and with a global debt in 2019 of about $233 trillion. It is a sure indicator that we cannot support the amount of consumption that we do in, in current terms uh, without incurring a debt to future generations. So we are literally borrowing from future generations. And th these data are pre-COVID. In the COVID era, as a response to COVID, uh, gl global governments have taken on another $10 trillion worth of uh, debt and uh, are likely to be taking on another $10 trillion before the economy is restored. And I use restored in, in, in quotation marks because I don't think we need to be restoring what existed before the COVID hit. We need to be moving to an entirely different economy. And I'll talk about it a little bit. It has also caused inequality over the last 100 years. You all know the numbers on inequality are staggering. 0.7% of the world owns 46% of the wealth, while 1.6 billion people still are in poverty. In the US, literally three men own as much as half the population owns. So this is not a sustainable way of evolving. The world stratigraphic society is calling this period of 1950s onwards, the Anthropocene, as opposed to the Holocene that we were operating in before. And that Anthropo term is used in describing this uh, upcoming era to point out that it is now humans that are driving all of nature's cycles. Whether it's the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the hydrological cycle, all of these cycles are now more impacted by human activities, social activities, 
than ever before. And we are literally controlling nature. We are the biggest force of nature. And by disturbing nature in such profound ways, we have created omni crises in all of our systems. The climate crisis, the biodiversity, pollution crisis, you can pick and choose the crisis that you can get excited about. Virtually all systems are in crisis and then we get hit by COVID. The net impact of COVID is anticipated to be a, a decline in growth uh, from plus three on the average, globally speaking, to minus three in the coming years. Up to 265 million people are expected to face food insecurity or famine. 30 to 50 million jobs lost across the world. At a time when robots and AI are likely to reduce structurally the need for human jobs, we are losing uh, existing jobs. And at the same time in 2020, in the seven, eight last, last eight, nine months of 2020, the billionaire's wealth went up by about $700 billion. So this unequal condition uh, and the, the idea that we cannot just continue to grow forever because there are natural environmental ceilings on how much growth can happen. And we have social aspirations or social foundation that we want all of the earths to be pro, uh, have at least food, water, income, education, resilience at a basic level. There is a kind of space between the social foundations and needs and the environmental ceiling that uh, uh, Kate Robert calls the safe and just space for humanity to exist. So managing the world at a planetary scale within this limit with a ceiling and a base is a new challenge that Anthropocene puts out to management scholars and to scholars in virtually every field. There is an urgent transition to planetary civilization uh, that is needed. And uh, without thinking of our management task in these planetary terms, we are not going to solve these problems because all of these problems are interconnected. And if we continue to operate to increase the size of GDP and create consumer societies like we have been doing for the last 100 years, we are simply not going to address. And in fact, we're going to make much worse and bring on the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis to harm us as a human race. So it is in our collective interest to be thinking about what transition to planetary management is feasible? How do we go about doing it? And uh, there are a number of books and reports that have been put out in the last couple of years. I especially recommend the work that Paul Raskin and his group are doing uh, on the great transition because they seem to take a, a big picture view of what it will take for us to come to a new equilibrium with nature. But there are of course many other groups. And this is all rather airy-fairy. It is too broad, it is too generalized. And so I want to concretize the challenge of the Anthropocene by taking one single element of carbon because it is probably the closest to, uh, as a surrogate for managing earth systems as a whole. So carbon is an essential element, all of you know. It has been in a particular range that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, for the last several thousand years. And in the last 50 years or so, since the mid 1950s, it has started to inch upwards. We know the basics of the global carbon cycle as it is called. Uh, we can continue to emit a certain amount of carbon into the atmosphere. Some of it gets absorbed in oceans and in forests, but in overall we are putting out and excess of carbon then the nature is able to absorb. The best science, and I'm referring to the summaries that IPCC and Future Earth and many other groups have provided over the last few decades is as follows. First, we as humans are burning about 40 gigatons of carbon per year, 35, 38, 39, 40, depending on what assumptions you want to make, these are not very, uh, is, uh, uh, tight numbers, but there are many different estimates based on models, but in general, that's the ballpark. If we burn 
565 gigatons of carbon, we will raise global temperature by two degrees. So 565 gigatons is called the carbon budget for Earth forever. You can burn those 565 ton gigatons today, or you can take at, at the current burn rate of 40 gigatons per year, it might take about 15 years to reach, or it can be extended to 50 years if we slow down the burn rate. And if we go to carbon negative, we might never reach the carbon budget and stay within two degrees centigrade. Two degrees centigrade is important because at two degrees centigrade, there are a lot of negative impacts in terms of agricultural productivity, biodiversity losses, uh, loss of uh, proteins in sea and oceans, uh, et cetera, as well as disease vectors that travel in all directions that we have no way of controlling or dealing with uh, health impacts. So we don't want to get to two degrees. In fact, the last uh, COP was trying to, and Paris Accord also tried to keep us within 1.5 degrees centigrade, but I'm, I'm putting two degrees as sort of the outside limit of where we can get to. So if we are, uh, okay, so the third point about carbon that you need to note is today, about 2,795 gigatons of carbon of fossil fuels is already known and acetized. By that, I mean sovereign funds, uh, uh, fossil fuel companies, they have discovered carbon. They know where it is, whether it's oil or natural gas or coal or other forms of carbon that can be used as fuel they already have it on their books. I've given a $27 trillion value to it based on 2020 average oil prices. But again, this number is uh, amenable to some adjustments based on what assumptions you're willing to make about prices. Now, obviously we can't burn all that carbon. Uh, in fact, we need to be able to retain if we are going to remain within two degrees centigrade, we need to be able to not burn about 2,200 gigatons. I just subtract 2,795 from, uh, uh, 565 from 2,795. This is stranded assets. It's called many different things. It's essentially what we should not be doing. And the, the, the asset value that I described is not just 27 trillion, it is uh, the, the financial impact of that 27 trillion is of course much larger because once you have something like that as an asset on your books, then you can create debts with it. You can issue stocks and build derivatives and create all kinds of financial pro products so that the total impact of that unburnable stranded fossil asset is much larger on the globe on the global economy. It is so large that even comprehending how to stop it would, would mean collapsing the existing economy the way it is currently constructed. So moving to low carbon lifestyles, moving to low carbon businesses, moving to low carbon uh, way of building an economy, the decision to do it is likely to be made by relatively few managers, maybe a thousand managers and a hundred companies, sovereign funds, maybe some government finance ministers and bankers, et cetera. And, and the question in my mind is like, does, do we really understand what just managing carbon means as, as individuals, as scholars, particularly as business school so scholars, do we understand the ethics and the responsibility for managing carbon? Are we doing enough to be able to get uh, to a low carbon economy and low carbon lifestyle? My short answer to that is no, but of course, this is the point for our conversation. We need to be, uh, I don't have a ready-made answer for it. I'm going to do one more slide before I want to pause and open it up to a, a little bit of thinking and questioning. But we want to collectively think about not just managing carbon, but managing all the other elements, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, which are of course key to agriculture and key to many other industrial processes. So uh, 
yeah, a couple slides around this idea of where, what direction to look for solutions. So the good news is that we have uh, a consensus, I think, a global consensus, not just a political consensus, not just a United Nations thing, but a consensus that the sustainable development goals as they were articulated in 2015 and signed by 192 countries is the general direction that we need to move. I call this uh, the global agenda is the official title, but this is sort of the core of the well-being economy that we need to be moving towards. And you will note that carbon is goal number 13. It's called climate action. Uh, actually, goal number one is no poverty and goal number two is zero hunger. Goal number three is good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, et cetera. All of you know these goals, so I won't belabor the point, but just to say that this is a systemic framework. It is not looking to reduce one element or another, but an interconnected way reduce our impact, our footprint on earth. And it's a framework that emphasizes that these things have to be done for all people in the world, not just for rich countries and within rich countries, not just for rich people, but for everyone. So everyone has a kind of human right to these, uh, this sort of network of values that uh, uh, we should be striving for. So behind these goals, there's a lot of economic thinking that has been going on. And uh, I want to just put up this idea of the well-being economy because I know the Humanistic Management Association is keen on some notion of well-being. Uh, in the last five or six years, this idea of well-being economy has taken a, a has received a lot of support. Uh, folks at the Club of Rome that I'm working with, we are building a, uh, a program on uh, transition to a new economy uh, built around the idea of well-being. And as you all know, there are many countries that are now pursuing well-being economy policies like New Zealand and uh, um, Scotland and Finland, etc. But what does the well-being economy mean? So just by way of definition, uh, this is an economy designed to provide human needs of water, food, health, education, shelter, energy, dignity, security, voice, and purpose for all. I rec recommend Costanza's article in the Solution magazine that very compellingly defines the characteristics of well-being economies. So equity and fairness are important. They have to be sized within the safe operating space of uh, planetary biophysical boundaries and social aspirations. And the goal is a sort of collective post-materialistic flourishing that recognizes spiritual dimensions of happiness, meaning as part of thriving. And not the mindless pursuit of GDP, which is what we currently do. On the right-hand side, you see a sort of graph of where countries lie on uh, GNP per capita versus uh, survival and well-being. And it is clear that there is good data to show that just growing uh, GDP or GNP or just growing wealth by itself does not necessarily make people happy and, and create meaningful lives. There is a certain amount of wealth that you need uh, and some countries have more than that and some countries have less. So there's not going to be one single path towards well-being global economy. We will have some countries that will have to continue to grow and other countries that will have to shrink their consumption in order to get to a, that balanced space, which is somewhere at the point of inflection on that curve on the right-hand side. Okay, I think I've put out enough out there that uh, <coughs> <laughs> that we have at least some basis for opening up a conversation. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment because I don't want to just continue talking. Uh, I can elaborate on all of these elements and I have another 20 slides actually, which I'm going to hold off from and open it up to thoughts, questions, comments on how do we, First of all, whether you think it is reasonable to argue for a planetary orientation towards management, 
or are we going to remain comfortable doing corporate management or business management or whatever management we currently do? And if you are a, you see logic in moving towards a planetary worldview, then how do we transform our own practices within business schools? And frankly, here you all are the experts. You all are teaching on a day-to-day -day basis and researching. I am nominally employed by a business school, but on my day-to-day -day work, I don't even go into the business school. I'm chief sustainability officer for a university which has 13 colleges, including the business school. So with that, let me pause and open it up to some questioning. And then depending on what direction the uh, questioning and discussion goes, I might throw up a few more slides. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Paul. Um, so in the interest of keeping our chat and discussion a bit manageable, we will moderate this prompt through the chat. And while everyone thinks about how we really can accelerate this transformation process towards sustainability, um, right, and a, a well-being economy, a nature-focused economy, um, or at least highly influenced economy. Uh, I'd like to invite Terry. You had a, 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 a great comment about humans and disconnection from nature. Do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, among other things, nonprofit management, and, and I've been in academia. Um, I teach Asian art history. And so I'm very aware of, you know, the millennia of connection to nature and to landscape. And they actually see it as a consciousness, you know, and, and you know, being that is the great harmony of, you know, human beings and nature. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking and writing about this for the past couple of decades. And one of the things, um, I gave a paper in the UK, maybe about a decade ago, and someone made a comment that it was related to Weber. I was talking about wonder, you know, the management of wonder. And he said, you know, for that machine model that we've been following, humans had to be disenchanted so that they're, you know, they're moved more towards efficiency and that what I was talking about or, you know, management and wonder is re-enchanting humans, mm -hmm. you know, giving them different eyes. So I, I just think that it's that reconnection with nature that is really crucial at this point, you know, whether it's through art or whatever, but it's an opening of the eyes to that. Yeah. Very important point, Terry. We'll take some more comments. I've got some other thoughts about reconnecting humans to nature, but I'll hold off till we hear a few more comments. Great, there was also a comment from Isabel on mindset shift. Isabel, do you wanna chime in? Hi. Um, well, yes, I just uh, was wondering what were your thoughts about how to shift the mindset? About what? How to shift the mindset. Oh, mindset, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Isabel. Great. Um, I also see Julia had a comment about an epistemology of crisis versus coordination. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yes, uh, hi. Um, I'm, I ju I'm just learning about this, and it just seems very interesting to think about how people are framing this um, differently in terms of epistemological foundation. So I'm just wondering, have you thought about or, or done any work on an epistemology of coordination in this scholarship? Yeah, okay. Well, those are the three good comments and maybe we can try to uh, add some reflections to that and, and maybe stretch it a little bit. So very clearly the imbalance between humans and nature is sort of the heart of what the whole uh, great acceleration studies point out that since we discovered energy, we have been utilizing it to uh, do the work that humans used to do or we used to get from the munificence of nature. 
And in our rush towards this kind of mechanistic worldview, uh, we have lost that emotional connection. So I very much agree with Terry's idea for the, of the need for reconnecting. How that reconnecting can happen is, uh, is actually not that difficult. It, as long as we acknowledge that it is, there are diversity and plurality of ways through which people uh, can come to nature. I work closely with a group of students over here who are trying to develop a pedagogy of a wilderness. And the idea behind it is to find ways of learning from nature by going out into the wilderness, experiencing it uh, in ways, not in objectified ways, but in more organic, life-giving ways. And uh, they draw a lot of inspiration from traditional indigenous knowledge traditions, which have this very organic view of nature and them being connected in deep ways. It's not part of our worldview in the West mm -hmm. or in the urbanized East, which is sort of following on the footsteps of the West, but there are authentic ontologies and epistemologies for that reconnection to happen. And I think at a personal level, we kind of get this to some degree or the other, because I look at people on this room and I know that each one of you has made that uh, attempt in your own work and in your own lives and try to fit it in the mainstream discourse uh, while perhaps not doing justice to it entirely. But I think there are many pathways to get to it. So that is a positive thing. I think the mind shift, uh, mind set shift is really at the heart of it. We need to be finding different worldviews. We need to be finding different cognitive maps for understanding what is going on. I think science is telling us now very compellingly that the me mechanistic map of the world, the disconnected map of humans and nature, all of these things that have made industrial society get as far as it has today is not really viable in the long run because the in we have sort of ignored or just uh, uh, not seen those interdependences and they're going to come back to haunt us. So having a new mindset that is more systemic, that is uh, uh, more encompassing and inclusive uh, is, is absolutely central and critical to this transition that we are talking about. And I know Isabel, you've got a book out on uh, mindset shift uh, towards sustainability transitions. And there are a number of other projects that are going on both within the UN and in fact, at the Club of Rome, there's a project called uh, uh, Envisioning a New Civilization, which attempts to do this kind of mind shift, if you will, and provide some alternative ways of framing uh, the bigger picture, as well as reframing what it means to learn or what it means to relearn to be human. I think we've learned to become human in a certain way, in an industrial mold. And we become comfortable with it, both in terms of accepting certain career choices and paths and certain lifestyle choices and paths. And that kind of human that has emerged after 300 years of industrialization, it's perhaps time for us to rethink whether that's the only way to be human or are there alternative ways of becoming human which would be more connected to nature and the point about uh, uh, having different ways of thinking. Yeah. Thank you. But welcome to other thoughts. I think the Humanistic Management Association in some ways is already starting to address these kinds of questions. So my, uh, uh, my take on this is that in some ways I'm preaching to the converted and at some intellectual level, most of us get it that there's this transformation needed, but we work under structures and I am part of that structure in my own university. So I'm not pointing a finger at anyone uh, specific. It's, but there is a structure that needs to be dismantled, to put it kindly. And if we are not dismantling it, we are supporting it. Willingly or not, happily or not, we are complicit 
in the system that we are decrying. So how do we find both the personal courage and those leverage points that we can slowly and steadily from the inside, not crash the system, but mold it in a different direction. So there are some wonderful comments. Thank you everyone for participating in the chat. And again, please continue to share resources. Um, Samra, do you wanna share your ideas about this idea of commitment to justice? Uh, thank you, Erica. Uh, yeah, I just uh, submitted a paper on energy justice. So, uh, and I used uh, Sovakul's articles and I loved them a lot. And the point was uh, we need to change uh, decision making, uh, current decision making concerning all those common goods mentioned are based on utilitarian decision-making approach, uh, but common goods need uh, more uh, sensitivity on justice, justice to the present and future generations. Uh, so uh, decision-making, uh, decision-makers may be educated of course, starting from business school, but uh, there are other professions, professionals making decisions. So just like AI solutions, artificial intelligence solutions, we need to uh, have ethicists as part of decision-making teams, maybe a collaboration between uh, engineers, public servants, and ethics business, ethics uh, uh, experts. So uh, decision making was my focus on this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a few more comments and then we'll try to have some response. So Stacy, would you like to remark on interdisciplinarity? Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you, Paul, for the presentation. I, I really, really uh, appreciated your comment there about the structures. And I'm wondering, uh, to me, business school itself, you know, um, is, is the structure. And uh, in Canada, we're reeling right now because of the discovery of a whole bunch of unmarked graves of children. And uh, one of the issues that you keep hearing is that um, grade school teachers feel uncomfortable teaching things like truth and reconciliation or the Holocaust, or they feel uncomfortable teaching these, um, these topics that require expertise beyond this narrow subject of, you know, leadership theory, or, you know, maybe they're, maybe you're comfortable doing some mindfulness in the classroom, but um, this need for interdisciplinarity and I wonder if there are examples or if you have ideas around how can we um, let go of uh, or attempt to dismantle the structure? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm making some notes, I'll come back. Is there one more comment that's connected that you want to take, Erica? Well, I know Daniela has been raising her hand but I haven't seen anything in the chat. Do you wanna raise? Your question, or we can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Yes. Okay, that's great. Sorry, technology issues. I want to say thank you first to uh, the great lecture, to all the wonderful comments and questions. This is very useful for me. I'm a PhD student uh, in Canada at uh, York University. So um, I want to say that um, I'm a teaching assistant, which means I'm a teacher and at the same time, I'm a student. So I'm kind of in the middle. And my impression is that uh, from my students, which are first year, who are first year undergraduate students, that they're a lot more on board for change. I actually have more difficult time to convince my professors for change. So for example, currently I'm trying to get them <laughs> to change how we do the dissertations to switch to three paper dissertations, which I'm sure most of you probably have it because it is uh, present in many uh, schools. 
and it just seems to be going difficult and it just seems they want to keep it the, the way how it has always been and so when i talk to my undergraduate students they're all about this environmental change and how do we make life better for the future so uh, i'm kind of trying to ask the question how do we change the mindset of the people in power and i see uh, professors as people in power or the administrative people at, at higher education so to me i feel like it's more of how do we change their mindset sorry if i'm wrong yeah. thank you okay that's good so I, I i'll make some comments on those three comments i'll take the last two first because they seem to connect and uh, the question of uh, operating in silos, how do we break that tendency or operating in disciplinary ways and move to interdisciplinarity or beyond interdisciplinarity to what I've been calling transdisciplinarity. Uh, I think disciplinarity has now become a disease of science. It started 300 years ago with some very noble goals to dig deep into a particular area of knowledge. But uh, over the 300 years, it has developed a life and logic of its own. And it has, along with that, its own internal logic of disciplinary inquiry, it has created structures of maintenance and self-perpetuation that are today harmful for gaining holistic knowledge at a planetary scale. We don't want more deep knowledge of narrower and narrower topics. We want shallow knowledge. Even if you think that is a pejorative word, I will say we need shallow knowledge of the whole planet, at least to a degree that we can control pieces of it. So the times have changed and science structures have not. In the last job that I held as the executive director of Future Earth, uh, Future Earth, is a network of about 50,000 scientists that do sustainability sciences. And we had five global secretariats that we were running to manage this network of studies. And one of the reasons why Future Earth was created was the realization that traditional science operating in disciplines had done an excellent job of specifying the problem while doing nothing about solutions. And each variable that science was helping us measure more and more accurately over the last 50 years had become worse. So the need was for science to be thinking beyond disciplines in a transdisciplinary manner. And in fact, doing science in a different way, using a different kind of epistemology that allowed stakeholder engagement in the co-production of knowledge, the co-creation of knowledge to solve real world problems. We had uh, uh, financing groups or funding bodies behind it. We had uh, science bodies behind it, the National Academies of Sciences of the G20 nations, the National Science Foundation. And I think that movement is still on. People are still trying to figure out how do we change 300 years of tradition of disciplined inquiry and move it to seriously and genuine transdisciplinarity. Now, I have to say that even my university, where I'm currently, has seven what they call interdisciplinary institutes. But interdisciplinarity is not a solution. Interdisciplinarity has been around since 1959. It's a 60-year-old idea, 70-year-old idea, if you will. We need to get to solutions. And that is where I, I feel that the internal structures of reward and tenure, and even what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, all I hear of my colleagues talking about is papers that they are publishing, will be publishing, have published. What's the meaning of a paper? I mean, if that paper, if it is just for you to, to put out something that nobody else is going to read, frankly, because that is the fact about writing academic papers. And, and I have written a lot of those papers myself, so I'm not holding myself above the fray. Uh, but to me today, this is not a meaningful intellectual exercise. And it is not you who are to blame as faculty members, partly you are to blame, or we are all to blame. 
But institutions need to realize that if we continue to reward papers or books or whatever we are rewarding as academic impact items and not be concerned about the real world impact, we are going to become irrelevant. We are already becoming irrelevant in a lot of areas of knowledge. And that's a hard way to, to understand who we are and be self-reflective. So I am very much in favor of transdisciplinarity. And to give you an example of how this might be done in a university setting, I'll share with you a recent decision that we've been part of. When I arrived here four years ago, uh, we are sort of heart of fracking country here in central Pennsylvania. And it is reflected not only in the energy mix we use, it is reflected in where our board of trustees come from. So 100% of our energy was dirty energy. We were falling behind. We had done a lot of great work in uh, uh, building efficiency and energy efficiency, but our uh, raw mix of fuels that we were using was largely fossil. So we got the opportunity to uh, take a look at some new contracts that were emerging around energy. And we found a company that was willing to do a solar power plant dedicated to our needs. 25% of our energy needs would be uh, met by this one single solar power plant that this company would invest in about $80 million. And we would guarantee to buy all that energy at a certain price that's lower than the fossil price and thereby save Penn State uh, about $14 million. But when we started looking at this decision, we realized that this is not only about decarbonization and saving money. To put up a 70 megawatt solar power plant, you are going to use 550 acres of land. And that 550 acres of land has certain ecological services that are going to be now disturbed or, or uh, destroyed, depending on how you deal with it. So instead of giving this decision to the energy department, we brought into conversation Nature Conservancy. We made them a partner in this decision-making process. An external body, and the reason we picked a Nature Conservancy is that they had just completed a solar energy plant land policy document. And we read that document, it was very far reaching. It looked at water flows, it looked at watershed management, it looked at animal migration, it looked at plant species, it looked at agroforestry under uh, what's called uh, solar agroforestry. So they had done this kind of thinking that Penn State, the largest agricultural university in the world in terms of research dollars, found that this was ahead of what we were thinking. So we brought them in, we took that policy, we slipped it into the RFP. We told the vendors, you can bid for this job, but you have to meet not just the economic requirements and uh, uh, the decarbonization requirements, but also the ecological requirements. And just for good measure, we threw in economic justice into the mix and saying that there has to be a certain investment that goes back into the community. Well, to cut this story short, it took us 18 months more than we should have taken. It took us 18 months more, not because there was great analytical work being done and models being developed, but just to convince our own board of trustees, our own financial managers, our own energy managers, our own lawyers. I mean, this was hand-to-hand -hand fight in a telephone booth with every single individual to make them go in that direction, forcing transdisciplinarity on them. But we were able to do it because the economics of it worked and they saw the co-benefits and, and monetized and quantified the co-benefits of managing the land in a responsible way. So I think it can be done. I think transdisciplinarity is something that is not just an idea. You can take individual solutions and build them out with the best pieces of what disciplines have to offer and add to it the values of justice. And somebody mentioned collaboration in one of the, the chat things. So, so it is doable. It, it takes more time. Uh, if you pick and choose your battles correctly, uh, I think, 
you can identify pieces of work that are going on in your own respective institutions and move that institution a little bit towards transdisciplinarity. The good news is that that 18 months of work or two years of work that we did has these reverberations that now that we are looking at managing water, we have a, a new construction going on, new water flows. Now people are thinking, oh, well, if we are going to do water, can we do this in a way that is connected to our agricultural fields? Can we use those fields as a soil filter before we put that water from our own treatment plant into? So this transdisciplinary learning is not just, you have to do it for every decision. Institutions have a way of learning also. So I, I want to leave you with a sense of hope and encouragement that while it is hard work to do transdisciplinary work, it is uh, both feasible and it might have downstream positive impacts. I'll stop there. I can go on on this stuff. Well, thank you. Um, there were two more questions that I think we're not going to have time to address, but I want to get them on the table because I think they're important. Marty, if you would like to ask your question briefly, and also Gerard, I thought you had a great question, again, just to sort of broaden the horizon of possibility. So go ahead with your questions, please. Uh, th thank you, uh, Erica. Um, I'm uh, extremely stimulated by this conversation due to <clears throat> the, uh, some of the writing that I'm doing as a retired social scientist and now a humanist chaplain in Western Canada. And that has to do with the fact that I'm really wondering whether you groups that are doing these multidisciplinary uh, solutions, uh, these great ideas that are coming out of the University of Massachusetts where you're getting students and faculty involved to actually make community impact, this is great. But this is a world and global issue. And I'm wondering whether there has ever been a historical time where your historical department and your social science and your scientists get together, has there ever been a time in you in the world history where we have cooperated at a level necessary to stop some kind of major global catastrophe that we can use as an example besides just creating all these brand new solutions? Has there ever been anything ever written about that historically? Yeah. Um, okay. And, and just one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap it up in a couple of minutes. But Gerard, can you ask your question yeah. very uh, quickly? Yeah, the, I was I was just wondering. That, thanks, uh, Erica. Uh, I was just wondering about the proportionality of efforts, particularly in the corporate world today, circular economy, ESG, a whole lot of things that are happening, which to me feel like they are way below the need that we have. Uh, in terms of both time and proportion to, in proportion to the problem itself. Uh, just today, I read a report that we have hit 419 parts per million in CO2, which is the highest ever recorded. And uh, this is despite COVID. So all macro indicators are suggesting that we're moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, and there's one minute left, so I'm going to do quickly. Marty, history, uh, I have great respect for history, but I think we need to understand that history was written in an empty world. It was written at a time when humans were not the dominant force on nature. So while I can't find a instance in history where nature was at a crisis point. Hold on for a second. My phone has gone off here. Sorry about that. Yeah, so while the, I can't recall of a time when we had a similar situation in history, we are truly facing a once in five millennium situation where we are in a, at a global scale, at a planetary scale that we are in this situation. So maybe there isn't a historical uh, time, but I look at the last 10 years and I find that to be interesting in terms of the coming together of humans in a common cause. 
And I point to the sustainable development goals that were passed by 192 nations. I don't think we have another treaty that is of this kind of global scope or planetary scope signed by 192 nations. So that to me is an indication that humans now supported by science realize what the stakes are and the, and the need to move in that direction. I want to also very quickly acknowledge Gerard's question about proportionality. And I, I do agree that uh, the solutions that are being put out, particularly in the corporate sector, are not, are not proportional to the problem. In fact, they are purposely disconnected from the problem of proportionality. And let me just point back to the carbon problem. We know the carbon budget of the world. We know the carbon budget of planet Earth. Show me one company that connects its carbon output to the total budget of the Earth. We, uh, companies put out annual reports on sustainability and say they save so much carbon, so much water, put out so much land, but they never talk about what this means in the overall scale. And the reason why they don't is because it is minuscule. And they are hiding behind all kinds of uh, incompatible standards and definitions to make themselves look good in a kind of global whitewashing exercise that constitutes this discourse on sustainability, which I have been party to myself. So I take part of the blame, but I think it is time for us to call the bluff and you cannot do circular economy and you cannot plant a few trees uh, or reduce a little bit of water and carbon and think the problem is solved. We need to come together to really address this as a planetary scale. And this is where I think management as a discipline is sitting at the face of a huge opportunity. No other discipline can do it. I can guarantee you that. I have 13 deans that I talk to on a regular basis, including earth and mineral sciences, including agriculture dean. And they don't have the tools to think in this way. They are much more constrained by the disciplinary silos that people have pointed out already. So I want to end by in a, in a spirit of hope and a challenge to all of you who are working within business schools to try to lift this way of thinking and, and build the structures that are needed to, to move us to the next transition. Thank you so much for a very thoughtful conversation. And I would like to see the chat because I, I, I noticed a lot more interesting questions there. So please make sure I get a copy of it. Paul, and I, I might respond to some of them directly. Thank you, Paul. Our thanks, everyone who's here today. Huge thanks, much gratitude. Be well, everyone. You will get the chat. We'll make sure everyone gets that. Um, we will also have the video available. Stay in touch if you have questions. It sounds like Paul is open to conversations. And again, we have plenty in the chat to work from. Thank you. Many thanks. Hey, thanks, Richard. He disappeared. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye everyone.